very soon. <laughs> but good news, I think it will be quite interesting, like all the other sessions as well. The topic of our last two speakers is bilateral effects on cross-border reorganization. It is a real case from Bavarian audit practice, and it was, among other circumstances, but one of the reasons why a deeper cooperation between Bavarian tax administration and Italian Agenzia delle Entrate was initiated, and it finally went into a pilot project on joint audits. And the pilot project is already finished, and we are getting in our second phase and working on real cases together with uh, auditors from Italy. We are very happy to have an Italian speaker today, and we are also happy to have two other colleagues from Italy with us. It's Italo Montoni and Vito Fornari. They are also from Agenzia della Entrata in Italy. We are very happy to have you here. It was a very successful starting point of our cooperation, and we are really curious to hear more about one of our cases soon. First of all, we welcome Franz Ruschka. He is head of tax audit unit in Munich, and he is the editor of a commentary on reorganization tax act. And also, he publishes frequently on national and international tax issues. And I'm very proud to announce Chiara Puzzolo. Chiara Puzzolo from Italy is director for tax assessment and international re relations in Rome. She joined the administration in 2002 and worked as auditor until 2008. From 2008 until 2012, she was seconded national expert with tax suit in Brussels and worked in the field of direct tax taxation especially on the triple CTB. Ladies and gentlemen, benvenuti to Chiara Puzzolo and Franz Ruschka. Hello and good afternoon Hello. from the two of us. And yeah, we hope the belly is full, the blood is in the stomach, you can relax, and we want to try to entertain you for the next 45 minutes with a case which, yeah, brought us, the two of us together, where we had a discussion on a cross-border merger between Italy and Germany. And, yeah, as we said, it was or it is a real case, although we must confess there are little tiny differences between the real, real case and the one we will tell you because we wanted to make it a little bit more interesting, so we put one or the other fact in there that, may, that will make it a little bit more interesting, at least in our opinion. As Larry van der Hoff mentioned this morning, we expected lots of differences in the national law of the other country. So it was a really exciting um, opportunity yeah, to start this project. And yeah, our common interest was that we yeah, wanted to have a look on the national law in both countries, as well how the merger directive was implemented in Italy as well and in Germany. And finally, there arises the question how the DTC between Italy and Germany works on the case. So these will be the three subjects we want to care about in the next minutes. Yes, and uh, we will see, uh, while we will address the case, that approximation of corporate income tax uh, uh, has already taken place to a certain extent, especially between Italy and Germany. And uh, while some differences remain, and sometimes they are material, but what it seems to us most important is that it's very crucial a common understanding of facts between the tax administration. And so this, at the end, will lead to the question on whether an enhanced cooperation, a further cooperation among tax authorities is needed, especially in cross-border situations. And we will reflect on this at the end of the case, probably. Yeah, but let's start with the facts. And actually, we had a German group whose parent company, we call it simply M Group, 
did its business all over the world, but especially in Italy through TSRL. And um, well, they identified a competitor. They said, oh, well, that would be interesting to buy the participation of this competitor, and then we will have a second way to do our business in Italy. Therefore, they identified ISA, and ISA was the head office, or let's say the, the parent company of an Italian group. They had well, several uh, participations of uh, subsidiaries. We call them ISRL. They also had free float shares with, a little, with, with, with just a very little level of participation. And finally, rights as trademarks, uh, as the trademark, the client space, and the goodwill. And yeah, in order to do this purchase, to do this acquisition, they took a loan from the bank from which, or for which they paid interest. And the first question that arose was, what happens, what happens to the loan and the interest after the purchase? Yes, um, we want to give you uh, an idea um, in the next slide on what happens if basically the situation is seen is, as is in a mirror also in Italy. So by assuming that the acquiring company is an Italian company, just to you know what will happen according to the national law. And well, we see that at least in Italy, the acquisition cost will be booked um, by the acquiring company. So there will be relevance for that. Yeah, and exactly, it's exactly the same in Germany. And of course, we know it's not the subject of the Italian tax administration to care about this. But for instance, uh, as we got in touch, it was simply interesting to get to know the other system of thinking. And so we, we thought it would be interesting for you as well to show the point of view of both countries. Yeah, and the dividends, by all means, they are, uh, that are spread from ISA to, or <coughs> distributed from ISA to M, they are tax exempt as well under the DTC because the participation was larger than 10%. It was exempt by the mother daughter directive. And finally, in Germany, it was exem tax exempt because of the, uh, because of our national law, because of section 8, paragraph. Uh, HB of our corporate tax code. And in Italy, it would be just the same. And of course, we will see the same uh, uh, treatment in the DTC as well as in the, ma in the parent subsidiary directive. And also, according to the Italian national law, we have a general rule for exemption. So it's just the same treatment. And then even the following point that we want to address which deals about a part of the dividend that is tax, 5% of the amount that is treated as non-deductible expenses in Italy, it seems to be just identical as in Germany. So it is. Yeah. And on the other hand, as there are more or less all dividends tax exempt, we, we grant the deduction of the full refinancing cost in, yeah, in the country or on the, on, on the tax basis, and this was allowed. So, so M could deduct the expenses for the interest with, uh, <coughs> on the German tax basis. Yes. And then, so basically, uh, we, we see that uh, the interest expenses as a general rule in both countries are deductible. Um, so we arrive at the conclusion that they are costs uh, that are allowed to be deducted for tax purposes. But then there is an interesting point here because, as you know, we have uh, a, spe a specific rule for limiting interest deductibility, which is based in Italy on uh, ABTDA model. And, uh, well, we just copied from you. So I think <laughs> it must be very similar to the German role. Yeah, we export good things. But <laughs> <laughs> it always depends on the point of view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think there is one, one remarkable difference between the, uh, this EBITDA rule in Italy and the one in Germany. 
And this is that we've got a threshold of 3 million euro yes. up to which the interest can be deductible without any restriction. And this is different to And Italy. this is different because we don't have such a threshold. So it's a little bit stricter in Italy, a BTDA. And then we have to mention at this point that, of course, the model rule for the interest limitation, it's, it has become an European model because we also see uh, that the anti-tax avoidance directive that was just approved in June include this rule as a de minimis rule for limiting the interest deductibility. So we can say that approximation at EU level is already reached in this, in this point, in this aspect. Yeah, and, so, and you see the national rules up to this point are very similar. Yeah, and... Um, well, let's have a look onto the facts, what's going on. Or maybe the conclusion for the first step was we allocated the loan to the head office of M, and we were all right that the interest paid was deducted on the German tax basis. But then happened the following step. The M group decided that ISA should be reorganized and it should be merged upstream onto the M group with the effect that the legal entity of ISA ceased and it was replaced by a fixed place of business in Italy. And yeah, for this reason, there arose several questions that I just want to summarize at the first glance like this. Um, first question was, is this or is such, a tax, uh, is such a merger possible tax neutral? Yeah, and then there were several uh, f <coughs> following questions as what happens with the strategic management, will this be sufficient, and so on. We've got several questions we want to show like this, and we will tell you. We will tell you. <laughs> now. Yes. Let's have a look to the question that uh, arise. The first one is, uh, what is the applicability of uh, national reorganization law on the cross-border merger? Then we will have a look onto the effects of a cross-border merger just under the national law. Then we'll see uh, the strategic management if it's an entrepreneurial activity under the DTC. And as we are in the DTC or under the DTC, we will have to think about whether the assets can be allocated to a permanent establishment under the DTC. And if we can allocate something, let's have a look at what happened to the liabilities and the refinancing cost. And finally, we will turn back to the effects under the national law and we will have a look onto the merger's profit or loss and how it is treated in both countries. Yeah, let's start with the applicability of the national reorganizational law on cross-border mergers. And in Germany, it's quite, quite easy. We implemented the merger directive since 2006, and since then, um, <coughs> we, only need, um, we only need that the participating legal entities were founded under European law and that they are situated with their, uh, with their legal basis and as well with their effective management in a EU member state. And the second uh, condition we ask for is that the cross-border merger accords to the German transformation or um, merger law. And yeah, how is it in Italy? Well. I think in Italy it's pretty similar, and uh, so another similarity, we uh, implemented the merger directive, really replicating the conditions set in Article 3 of the merger directive in our national code, uh, for one that want to know exactly, is Article 178 of the Corporate Income Tax Code in Italy, and basically we ask uh, that the merger takes place between company that has a legal form that is listed in the annex of, uh, an annex of the merger, that they are tax resident in one member state, and that they are subject to a tax that is the one included in the list in the annex of the merger directive. 
So I think we are there is really a similar treatment. We just apply the merger directive, and we have understood in the same way, which is important. Yeah, but then we had a look on the effects of the cross-border merger, and then we find out that basically we follow the same target, but we have a different approach to reach it. And maybe this is quite interesting for you. Um, for the Germans, all they know, since 2006, we changed the system in the merger. In the meantime, we say that all hidden reserves has to be shown in the merger, except the taxpayer files for carrying forward the book values, and Germany is allowed to tax the transferring uh, the, the, the transferring assets after the transfer. And um, the, ba the, the basic idea is that a merger is like the change of assets into a participation. And so it's just an act of reali uh, real realizing um, hidden reserves, which have to be shown. And I want to repeat, the exemption which, of course, is the normal case in, in national uh, mergers, the exemption is that the hidden reserves are not shown in such a transaction. How well, is it in Italy? As Franz said, the target is the same. So the target is to grant tax neutrality to uh, cross-border merger business restructuring. But in Italy, we really start with this tax neutrality as a basic principle. And we apply tax neutrality for both national business reorganization and cross-border business reorganization. And in fact, if you look at the article I mentioned before, that is 178 of uh, our national corporate income tax, it just refers back to the rule of national cross-border uh, business reorganization. So um, basically, uh, of course, in both countries, tax neutrality is granted to the extent that assets stay connected with a permanent establishment. This is, of course, the condition. And we also have uh, the rule that says the taxpayer has to show the hidden reserve. But this is our procedural law that requires this just for the purpose of sending a tax return. So it doesn't hamper really the granting of the tax neutrality. And I have to mention that uh, quite recently, we uh, also uh, e expand the possibility to give a deferral for the exit taxation that may apply if assets are transferred from Italy to another country as a result of a business organization. So we also have the possibility to grant deferral for the taxation. Yeah, and um, I think that's quite interesting. It's, I think this is a situation that is comparable with our 4G of the income tax code, where we have as well the possibility to defer the taxation of the exit tax, or the, to defer the payment of the exit tax, uh, of the exit tax for over four or five years. And um, well, there, there arises only the question whether this right also exists if the exit takes place under the, uh, under the German law of mergers. Because we always defer on the exit taxation under the general rule, which is the, four, uh, the section 4 sentence, uh, no, section 4, paragraph 1, sentence 3 of the income tax code, or of, um, of section 12, paragraph 1 of the corporate tax code. On the one hand, normal exit taxation, and on the other hand, the exit taxation that is based on the merger tax law. So there is a difference, but coming back to our case, the main, or the main question that arose was, um, yeah, is there an effective connection with the PE? Because this is the basic question that is uh, necessary to answer whether the right to tax the hidden reserves remains in the country, the PE is situated. And there, just an information for the German slide, 
in the German slide, there's written on the Deutsche Betriebsstätte, and this is an outtake, I feel very, very sorry for this, it's just the PE in the territory, or, the, or let's say the, the attribution of the assets must stay in the, on this territory, the PE is situated, but it must not have, uh, it does not have to be necessarily a German PE. Thank you for this clarification, also from the Italian side. <laughs> <laughs> it would be too much just to have it in, in Germany. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. We start with a very, very special German issue. Um, Als die Frage aufkam, mit dem Merger, das heißt, das Rechtsobjekt von ähm, ISA bestand ja dann nicht mehr. Das heißt, danach in Italien... Business. And the question was, whether this fixed place of business can be regarded as a permanent establishment under the DTC, because only if it is a PE, assets can be attributed to it. And we have a long discussion with our Court of Appeal, Bundesfinanzhof, whether every entrepreneurial activity under the national law creates an entrepreneurial activity under the DTC. And the administration worked very easily. I want to remember to Michael Lang, who yesterday mentioned the complication in the interpretation with the usage of Article 3, Section 2 of the Model Convention, where he said, we always do not know what is meant with this, you may refer to the national law. For the administration, for many years, it was completely clear that the question whether there is an entrepreneurial activity under the DTC is answered by the national rule, but we found out with several decisions of the Bundesfinanzhof that this approach is not all right. And well, we were convinced. And in 2014, we followed the jurisdiction of the Bundesfinanzhof at that point. And we gave, up, uh, we gave this idea up. And now this means just a deemed entrepreneurial activity as it is, for instance, under Section 8, Paragraph 2 of our corporate tax code, will not be sufficient, sufficient to create out of the asset management of a corporation an entrepreneurial activity. We, moreover, need a real and original entrepreneurial activity, as it is described, for instance, in Section 15, Paragraph 2 of our income tax code. And, um, yeah, coming back to the case, we had the strategic management which was done in this fixed place of um, fixed place of business, and yeah, this is regarded as sufficient to be treated as an entrepreneurial activity under the DTC. But tell me, do you have such a complicated jurisdiction as well I, in Italy? I spent some time trying to understand uh, this concept, which is particular, peculiar of uh, your jurisdiction. And I think I haven't understood really correctly, <laughs> but some things I haven't understood that is probably that we also have in Italy um, the granted business activity for certain companies that uh, have legal form. So that's probably the same situation in uh, Germany, but this kind of question never was posed, was never posed to our court, and I hope it will not be posed because it seems very complex to, <laughs> to be solved. So uh, we, we, don't have the, we didn't have this discussion. Uh, what we would do is just to apply um, the, relevant, the relevant convention, the notion of the P, so relevant uh, article according to Article 5 of Model Tax Convention, we also have a national rule that describes the PE, so a definition of a PE that is internal. And then at the end for us is a matter of fact, of course. And since the existence of a PE uh, in the meaning of uh, strategic management and fixed place of business is a matter of fact, 
just I want to mention that we recently introduced a special advanced ruling just for giving some certainty to the taxpayer that they can ask whether a P exists. Uh, and it's just a procedure that is also very close with the possibility to ask then an APA just to determining in advance the allocation of profit uh, and is based on the, of course, a dialogue between the tax administration and the enterprise. I think this is a very interesting point, but um, never the, uh, <coughs> anyway, in with us, it would be no problem to ask for an inbound case, I think, whether there is a PE that we can tax or not. Yes, we will say yes. Um, if there is a PE inbound, we will give this ruling without any doubt. Yeah, but when we have the, the PE, the next question arises. What happens with the allocation of the assets to the PE? And we identified basically three different assets. And we want to start with the strategically held participations. And there I must mention the case took place in a time before the implementation of the AOA here with us in Germany. The AOA was implemented from starting from 2013. And as we heard yesterday from Siegfried Müller and Gerhard Gierlich, uh, in the meantime, we got the decree of the Federal Tax uh, Ministry, which rules and shows all the solutions for all the arising questions with the allocation. And I want to remember, we can this discuss, discuss later on, we already heard something about the attribution of participations under the AOA, and you will see there will be a, t uh, there will be a little difference. Let's start with the strategically held participation. The, strate <coughs> the question how we attribute such assets to the permanent establishment is legally based in Article 10, Section 4 of the DTC, where it is written that only such assets can be attributed to the permanent establishment which are effectively connected with the activity done in the PE. So we need a genuine link between the activity in the permanent establishment and the activity in the held subsidiary. Yeah, and in our case, this was pretty simple. We had a strategic management. The, um, <coughs> those, uh, the staff of the PE influenced the daily business of the subsidiaries. And so this gene win link was given and there we, we were able, yeah, to see the effective connection. But for an effective connection, there is another condition that has to be fulfilled because it's necessary that the shareholder can enforce his will in the subsidiary. And for the strategically held participation, this was no problem as the participation was always much larger than 50% in general they were held by 100%. So they could, or the PE could enforce his will, its will in the subsidiary, no problem. We could allocate the strat strategically held participation in the PE. Yeah, but there's the very big difference to the free float. The free float Is, has not the same level, it's a level below 50%, otherwise it wouldn't be free float. And the, so the, member, uh, the, the staff of the PE was not able to enforce its will. And so this gene win link for the effective connection was missing. And the effect is, that we could not attribute the free float anymore to the, to the permanent establishment. If you want to have a legal, or, or let's say a, 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 yeah, a practical basis for this decision, you should have a look at the decree of the Ministry of Finance 
from Christmas 99, where it was written, there exists a central function of the head office which attracts all free float income and cash, and as well free float shares, and this was the legal basis for this attitude. Maybe we can come, to the, uh, come back to the AOA later on in the discussion, then we can talk about this case again. But the conclusion was these assets move because of the merger from Italy to Germany. So the next question arose, with which price? And I want to remember, we only have a rule in our merger tax code about the declination of the tax law, but not for an improvement. Not, not declination for the decline of for the decline of um, of the tax law uh, of the tax taxing right, not of the improvement, and. When assets move from Italy, from, from a tax exempt permanent establishment to Germany, the right to tax these assets will be improved, by, uh, will be improved and will become better. But we've got a rule as well in our income tax code. This is uh, the Verstrickungsregel. I, have, I haven't found a proper name to translate this. Sorry about that. Um, at, but it was. Uh, it will be, let, let's try. It will be section, section four, paragraph one, sentence eight, half sentence two of the German income tax code under which it is ruled that such assets enter the German territory with the market price. So they were uh, balanced in the head office with the market price. Yeah, and finally, there were the rights, and all these rights were, I will make it brief, um, connected with the effective uh, activity of the staff in the permanent establishment, so we decided it would be no problem to leave or to attribute the trademark, the client space, and the goodwill to the permanent establishment in Italy. Right, then, um, then the question is, uh, did you agree? Yes, we could <laughs> agree. So that's good for the taxpayer. Um, even though we will see later on that not everything can be good. But um, of course, we, uh, even before the AOA was introduced in Italy, that is a very recent uh, law, um, we, uh, we looked at the situation in a quite different way. We don't have uh, this um, circular or implementing regulation prior to the AOA that would really define a little bit the role about uh, allocating participation free float or strategic health participation. We uh, would look at the fact with some uh, consequences and for instance uh, for the free float we would look at whether in the PE there are asset managers who bear the risk of uh, trading and uh, who uh, decide about the trading and who bear the risk of losses for training, uh, and what is the role of the head office in this respect. And in this case, based on the fact, we could agree that the free float could go to uh, the head office in this case. But I think we, we still have a different approach before the AOA a little bit, and after, then is a question what happened with both countries that have implemented AOA, and how we would look at the same situation. Yeah, but then there was the question, what happens with the liabilities and what happens with the interest paid? And of course, the question was whether whether Italy does an exit taxation on yes. the transfer of the free float. Yes, yes, because they were leaving. Mm. Yes. It's not possible to have everything. <laughs> yeah, coming back, we were, uh, we were asking the question what happens with the liabilities and, yes. the, and the interest paid, and of course up to the merger, 
the liabilities of the loan and the interest paid was linked with the participation that M held in its head office in Munich. And then with the merger, the participation ceased. And as there was no participation to link the liability uh, with which the liability could be linked, we had to look with what for assets the, um, the loan was linked. And we found out, of course, this loan was taken to purchase not the participation, but the assets that were held by the corporation whose participation it was. So it was no doubt about that the loan moved from the head office in Munich down to the permanent establishment in Italy. And not only the loan itself, but as well the interest paid, which meant that those interest expenses could not anymore be deducted in Germany. And in Italy, we, we looked especially about uh, the free capital allocation of the PE because we, of course, uh, wanted to see whether uh, the PE was granted a sufficient free float capital, free capital to support uh, the PE in its function, risk, and asset. And that was the case. Yeah. And of course, the allocation of free capital is well known as, uh, with us as well. And I only want to remember to the presentation of Gerhard Gierlich and uh, Siegfried Müller yesterday, where the problems were shown under the AOA. And the same basic question was to answer with us in former days as well, but it did not arise or it did not become, in, uh, uh, yeah, it was not important for the case. Yeah, but finally we had to have a look what happens to the profit or loss that comes out of the merger. And yeah, because of the merger, we, as already mentioned, ISA, the, the participation of ISA ceased. And instead of the participation in the balance of M, now the participation was replaced by the by all the assets that formerly were held by ISA. Yeah, and the difference of the seizing participation and the arising assets generates a profit or loss. And in an upstream merger, this profit or loss is treated as, let's say, a natural dividend from the seizing participation or from the seizing subsidiary to the shareholder and such a distribution would be tax exempt under section 8b of our corporate tax code and we would only tax 5% as non-deductible expenses as we've already heard as it is in Italy. And so this was the solution for the profit out of the merger, and just for information, if it is a loss, this loss will not be taken into account from Germany. It's pretty similar than the situation, according to Italian law. Um, we, we don't have this 5% deemed expenses, but what we have that maybe is a little bit different is that we grant the, ta the taxpayer the option to have the profit recognized for tax purposes, um, just paying a tax that has a lower tax rate than the ordinary corporate income tax. So I think you don't have in Germany such a role. No, we are not able to, yeah, to have a special taxation for the shown hidden reserves. No, we don't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Then the next step the case is going on. The next step was that
the permanent establishment in Italy was contributed to TSRL. And the reason the company said why they did this eight months after the upstream merger was that it would make sense as TSRL already uses the, the brand and the name of the company and this would make things easier. Well, we have to accept this. But so the question arises: what happened? What happened in this contribution of a branch in Germany and in Italy? All right, there are new shares. Let's see the questions. Was, isn't the transferal or the contribution possible tax neutral? What happens to the, to the assets of the permanent establishment as well with the liabilities? And uh, yeah, let's have a look on this. I'm sorry, the headline does not fit to the content, but this happened. Sorry about that. That was my mistake. Yeah, first of all, we want to show you the German point of view just in comparison to the Italian point of view. And of course, since 2006, with our merger tax code, we are able to apply this code on all mergers that take place in Europe, no matter whether it has an effect on the German tax basis. So we had a good opportunity to have a look onto this case. And yeah, the transfer is possible tax neutral. That's very simple. All the assets that were attributed to the permanent establishment, not the free float, as the free float, you remember, this was in the head office, but the rest was attributed to the permanent establishment. It could be contributed as the branch with the book value to the uh, to TSRL, and yeah, that's yeah, that's it at that moment. And how did you do this in Italy? I cannot say that the operation is fully tax neutral because we have to divide the two level. Um, as for the assets, uh, the contribution of uh, uh, a branch contribution of a P is also um, regulated by the merger directive and we should grant tax neutrality to the asset which are contributed. So of course the uh, asset could be contributed at book value without uh, emerging hidden reserves. Um, as for the shares that were given in exchange for the contribution, there is a different treatment. Um, what we understood and uh, is our understanding of the merger directive as well, uh, the merger directive does not regulate on the shares in this situation expressively. It remind, it uh, refer back to national law. And in Italy, uh, we would see uh, the allocation of the shares to the PE as the last step of the business activity of the PE, and so we would tax in the sense that they would emerge, the hidden reserve, but of course we would apply the participation exemption rule, so we would exempt uh, the uh, hidden reserves in this sense, apart from the 5%. So uh, this is the, v the view. Uh, in this case, also on the, on the whole contribution of the P uh, in Italy. It's really much linked to the fact that there is no longer a permanent establishment in Italy after this. And this is really different from, from the German point of view. And maybe that makes simpler if you imagine that on the one hand, the PE, just, just imagine the PE would be an entity. Under the AOE, A, this is much easier than it was in former days. But just imagine the PE would be an entity and the PE contributes all the assets to the TSRL, 
And in contrary, the new shares that are given back, they are not given to the German head office, but to the still existing PE. In our understanding, with the, tra uh, with the contribution, the, the PE is gone, and there is no place of business left into which these new shares could be granted. But Italy, as far as I understood, works with a fiction with which they assume that these new shares are put into the remaining PE, and after this, the transfer from the PE to the head office takes place, and this is the second, or th this is the moment in which the exit taxation under Italian law takes place. It's a completely different thinking from ours, and frankly said, it took me quite a lot of time to understand this way, but it's the way it is. Um, yeah, but we will have to uh, must have a look onto the costs of acquisition, and of course. Those, also, those assets were transferred by book value under the German point of view into the TSRL. We never had a right to tax these assets or these is hidden reserves, and therefore we have a regulation in uh, section 20, paragraph 3, sentence 2 of our merger um, tax code, in which it is said that under such conditions, we price the received new shares with the market value. So it is safe that there will be no hidden reserve that can be taxed in Germany. No double taxation. No double taxation. And I think this is exactly the same with you in Italy. So there finally remain the financing costs and the loan. And of course, they were attributed to the PE, and they moved with the PE. So finally, the loan and the liabilities end at TSRL. That's the way it is. And yeah, we actually, we found out that it is very important to have a common look on such facts. Because it's not only the understanding of the law, it's also very much an understanding of the facts. Yes. And this is why we said at the very beginning that uh, this, is, uh, this experience is like a joint audit uh, and uh, looking at the fact uh, at the same time, uh, it really helped because there is um, a common understanding in the moment you look at the fact. What is Timing is very important as well. So we really think uh, that it helped very much that the cooperation was activated uh, in this case, and it will help very much other cases if we can activate closer cooperation. And this is why we, uh, we are carrying on the project that was mentioned before on joint audit, just to uh, try together to reach the best possible solution uh, for, uh, for us and uh, to avoid also costly uh, procedures for the taxpayers as well. Yeah, and as, or, uh, as Larry van der Hof mentioned this morning, that w another very important point would be to understand the cultural differences. For me and for my visits in Rome, one of the very comfortable, uh, let's say, cultural differences were that there you will have a glass of wine for lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for a most interesting presentation. And we are now curious about the following comment. Ladies and gentlemen, there is this saying, best things come last. So uh, I introduce Dr. Jens Schoenfeld, uh, a lawyer and expert on tax law with a broad expertise on international tax issues, corporate tax law. Uh, he speaks regularly at national and international conferences, gives lectures at universities, 
and is very well known in Germany. So we are very happy and we are very much looking forward to the very last comment of this year's Tax Audit Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jens Schönfeld. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chiara. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the interesting case. And uh, there's a lot of peace between the two of us, uh, uh, the two of uh, the tax, uh, tax administrators. And uh, well, I will try to give some remarks from um, a tax advisors and a taxpayers' uh, perspective. Well, I think the standard case is interesting, but more interesting is the merger case. Uh, as well as the subsequent um, contribution. And uh, starting with the merger case, there are two questions um, which arise. The first one is, um, what are the requirements for a strategic holding um, uh, PE? And the second one is, which assets could be allocated? And well, starting with the first one, strategic management holding function, well, we learned from Franz Ruschka that in inbound cases, cases it's never be a problem. But um, well, I say I, I, I have to say, um, from a tax advisor's perspective, this is not true. And my favorite not case is a reorganization um, of a quite famous uh, family-owned business, and we had a limited partnership a German limited partnership, which uh, was a proper holding with over 100 employees. And uh, this partnership um, uh, held uh, many, um, many shares, many uh, subsidiaries, and two subsidiaries were a, a production subsidiary and a sales subsidiary. And the fiscal authorities, and they said, well, we are not sure whether this is a PE under the treaty. So 100 people, well, a lot of um, uh, return, but uh, um, no permanent establishment under the treaty. So we considered uh, to reorganize this um, limited partnership by merging the sales corporation into the holding LP. And we thought, well, with the sales function, it must be a proper PE. Well, the fiscal authorities, they said, well, we need an effectively connection between sale and production. Well, we, can't, we can uh, imagine that um, uh, a share in a sales company could be allocated to a production function. But we couldn't imagine that uh, a share in a production company could be allocated to a sales function as a production function, as a leading function. Well, in the end, the merger was fine, the merger of the sales um, uh, company, but the, the case shows um, how tough the requirements are to establish um, a strategic holding permanent establishment. Well, I think it's my feeling, meanwhile, um, a strategic management holding function is generally accepted and a bit more relaxed. However, the question is, which assets could we allocate? And today, we learned from Franz Groschka that shares could be allocated, but only if we have a threshold of 15% in that company. Well, I couldn't agree with that. We have the same issue in European tax law. You remember, we have it... Um, um, with the exercise of the freedom of establishment. And the European Court of Justice decided that um, it is just important for exercising um, um, the freedom of establishment by um, having a substantial influence in the management of the company I'm participating in. And the European Court of Ju Justice also said well, there's no minimum threshold. It's a question of the facts, just the facts. Yeah? You can also have an influence, a substantial influence, by 20% or even 10%. Yeah? And so I'm not sure whether this theory of 
50% minimum thre threshold um, is correct. Well, moreover, I think um, also portfolio investments could be effectively connected with a permanent establishment. I will give you an example. In our case, guess our um, Italian company has a participation of 10% in a competitor. Well, the management of the Italian company will not have a substantial influence in the competitor company, but nevertheless, it could make sense to have that share yeah, in the competitor for many reasons. And therefore, I would say, of course, that share could be effectively connected to the strategic holding function of the Italian PE. Well, coming to um, VIP, we heard that from a German perspective, only homemade or self-made IP used by the PE could be allocated to a PE. I'm not sure whether this is correct. Well, I can buy, of course, some IP, and uh, it could, of course, be effectively connected uh, to that PE. And uh, furthermore, uh, from a practical point of view, you find often situations in which um, a company holds more than a PE which it um, uses by itself. Yeah, for example, any brands or patents just to protect that the competitor don't use them. So, and even such a IP, from my point of view, shall be allocated to a permanent establishment. Well, to put it straight, I think it's, al it's always a matter of the facts, and the important question is whether um, the assets could be or are c effectively connected with the business of the PE. Well, I have a further questions for my colleagues on the panel. Well, I learned today from Chiara that uh, Italy has uh, already uh, introduced the, the AOA approach. And my question would be whether this AOA approach might change the situation, might change the merger situation from a tax point of view. Yeah, because what does the AOA approach do? To put it as simply, the AOA approach says, well, the PE is a kind of corporation, a deemed corporation, a deemed company, and it shall be treated, the PE shall be treated um, as a company. So, from a tax point of view, ac actually, the upstream merger is not an upstream merger, it's more sidestep merger, yeah, because you merge a proper Italian corporation in a deemed Italian corporation. In brackets, it's our PE, yeah, our AOA PE. So, and it would be my understanding that nothing will change. Yeah, there's no need to allocate any assets because before we allocated the assets to a, a proper Italian corporation and after that we need to allocate it to the deemed Italian corporation. Well, we may discuss this maybe later. Well, to illustrate some further obstacles, um, I will amend the case a bit. Yeah? Let's assume that the shareholder of the Italian company um, shall be either a private individual or a company, a parent, which is just a plain legal body without any function. And then after the merger or after the transforming of the Italian um, company into APE, we have to ask what assets are we allocating to a proper Italian PE, which I have, and which assets do I allocate either to that individual, which does not have, who does not have uh, any PE, or to this substanceless um, parent, which does maybe has a place of effective management, but not a proper entrepreneurship and not a proper PE. I would say, in those cases, I do allocate everything to the Italian PE as, under the treaty, this is a proper permanent establishment.
So if we allocate assets to Germany, which uh, uh, both want to do, the question is whether Germany allows a step up in the assets, yeah, the assets which are allocated to Germany. Well, I think this is important for the next step, the contribution, because he wants to tax the assets who are, which are in, in Germany. Well, and this is a question which is not quite clear yet. Under the German um, Reorganization Act, the Italian company could apply for the continuing of the book value. And I would strongly recommend uh, to do so because that has um, uh, an impact on um, the merger profit. Yeah, the profit which may result out of the difference between the book value of the shares in the company and the book value of um, the assets held by the company. And yeah, if we opt for uh, the continuing of the book values, these, this um, um, profit will be quite low. So the problem is, if we choose the book values, maybe Franz Ruschka would say, then you have the book values in your German balance sheet. Well, I would argue that from a time-wise perspective, later, yeah, the assets come after the merger from the Italian PE to the German parent. Yeah? And in that moment, which is from a time perspective, perspective later than the merger date, um, the German tax law allows a step up in the assets which are allocated to Germany. And as I said, this is important um, for the contribution case because from a German tax perspective, the contribution is not tax neutral insofar as we have assets in Germany. Yeah, but if we allow a step up, that gain which may result uh, from that contribution is not that high. And furthermore, we could use our retroactive um, uh, contribution for German tax purposes, and then this difference between the value, um, um, between the merger and uh, the contribution would be quite low. So the last point, um, from an Italian perspective, I learned the contribution shall not be tax neutral regarding the shares in the Italian company. Well, I have my doubts whether this is correct, yeah, because I think uh, Italy is not allowed under the treaty to tax the gains uh, in this uh, share because that would provide that I could allocate uh, the shares, the new shares, to a permanent establishment. Well, but what are we doing? We are transferring the permanent establishment in the company. So, from a German perspective at least, there is no chance to have an actively, uh, effectively connection between um, the new shares and a permanent establishment which does not exist. And, uh, well, we may discuss it. Um, these are my short remarks on the case. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I guess we are starting right with the comment from the administration side. Mr. Oskar? Oh, there were lots of questions. <laughs> and I will, I will try to go as fast as possible through them. First of all, I think the, the question what the main facts for a management holding permanent establishment would be are that the strategic management is done by the staff of the PE, which means, I, I repeat, um, <coughs> which means that the staff of the PE really influences the, not, not, not necessarily every step of the daily business, but important facts of the daily business in the subsidiaries. Then I think it should be no problem to accept 
a strategic management as an original entrepreneurial activity. And um, at least in Bavaria, and we learned that Bavaria is not Germany, but yeah, main part. this should be well possible. And I don't know where you had your bad experiences, but I'm sure not in Bavaria. Um, then the next question arose was um, whether it is possible to allocate a participation that produces goods to a uh, permanent establishment that sells the produced goods. Because it would be the value chain, but in the wrong direction, if I understood you correctly. Yes. And I think it's not important in which direction the value chain is. It's only important that there is a value chain. So I wouldn't have a problem to allocate the production subsidiary to a sales permanent, a sale permanent establishment. OK? Attribution of participations. Of course, I've mentioned this minimum threshold of 50%. As you know, I love a clear rule because it makes it simple to apply. And of course, I know that you can discuss whether it is all right with the freedom of establishment that there can be attributed a participation with lower than 50% to a permanent establishment. I won't say completely no, but I've put it the other way around. As long as I'm over or the level is higher than 50%, there will be no doubt that if the other preconditions are fulfilled, the allocation will be all right. And below, it depends on the case. Let's put it that way. But the free float, if you only think about 10%, I think there it is very difficult to, yeah, to, 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 to generate the idea of the, of the effective link of the daily business. Because the only way to influence the subsidiary can be that you refuse to fulfill specific um, decisions that were done on the level of the subsidiary. But you cannot do more. So I think the, the required link of effective connection cannot be given with a free float. The only thing is, this may be under, uh, under the aspect of the AOA, um, that you attribute a free flow to a permanent establishment. As you say, the asset management is the most important function, and this function is done in the permanent establishment. Then this may be correct. But the genuine link between the activities I cannot see in this case. And this would be the answer as well to the strategically held um, participation of 10% um, of the competitor. I ask, or I wonder, where I do find the functional link between the activities. Because the only function of this strategically held um, participation of 10% is to have a participation to block, not, uh, to block um, dev specific decisions in the subsidiary, but you will not influence. And this function can be done as well from the head office. So there is no reason why you should attribute this participation to the permanent establishment. Then the, uh, the board IP. The bought IP, I think it's more or less exactly the same answer. It depends whether there is a function in which the bought IP is used in the, B in the PE, then it would be no problem. But if it's simply held, that won't be sufficient in my understanding, as well under the AOA. Um, then the deemed corporation, the sidestep merger, you remember, uh, Jens said, we treat the upstream merger as a sidestream merger, as the P 
PE is regarded as a separate entity. And if it is a separate entity, there is an entity that has to be accepted. Well, you know, we've got a rule in our uh, foreign tax code, in our Außensteuergesetz, um, that says that, that there remains a, basis, a basic idea of being a permanent establishment. And the permanent establishment is not a subsidiary. And I think, actually, this is the point where, where, this, where we are at your question. We will reach this point, And I think we will ask, or, or we will not accept to, yeah, to, to see the permanent establishment as a fully accepted legal entity. Because in this case, we could give up the AOA and we, we would simply say the permanent establishment is to treat like a subsidiary. That's it. Yeah. We did not do so. Yeah. So finally, ah, the final question was AOA, the individual without a fixed place of business and whether entrepreneurial activity or, uh, let's say, entrepreneurial assets can be attributed to this uh, individual. There we have to distinguish between the national law and the, tax, uh, and, and the DTC, in my understanding. Under the national law, since the uh, implementation of the AOA, we have a very peculiar saying that we have a head office permanent establishment. We do not anymore talk about the head office. It's a head office permanent establishment. And from this point of view, I can understand your point of view. Now you say, At the place of residence of the individual, there must be fulfilled the preconditions of a permanent establishment to attribute assets there. In the double tax convention, which is still in power, also we have the AOA, we only talk about the residence of an enterprise. And the residence of an enterprise is the residence of the individual. And the permanent establishment is just a part of the enterprise of this individual. So there is no reason to refrain the attribution of assets to this individual. That's it. Well, which is quite good, because in exit cases, uh, we usually uh, have the situation that a person moves from Germany to uh, abroad, And uh, in this person owns shares, for example, in a limited partnership. And um, if I understand you correctly, if this person does not have an office or an office desk in his uh, flat abroad, then we do not allocate any assets from Germany uh, to the foreign country. With the result that we do not apply any exit taxation on this. Yes. Right. Gentlemen, it's quite interesting to listen, but we have written first comment, Jens Schönfeld. <laughs> so there should be a second comment from the audience. Please feel free to ask your question, give your statement in German or English, even in Italian if you prefer. Uh, we are completely international here. Professor D'Angelo from the University of Bologna, and we are especially happy to have him here as well because he was involved in our pilot project and gave his academic opinion on the things we did. So yeah. very, very warm welcome to you, and please, the floor is yours. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks to you for inviting me. And yes, I have been involved in a, a validation, sort of academic validation of this pilot project together, to, together with Professor Eckhart Reimer from University of Heidelberg. Me, I'm from University of Bologna. And uh, of course, uh, it, has been not, uh, it has been a very interesting project because we had the opportunity to investigate this uh, joint audit uh, cases. And I have uh, a question for uh, Franz Ruska and uh, Chiara. 
and Chiara Puzzolo. Um, uh, uh, from the last panel over here, that there is a large consensus about uh, joint tax audit. Everyone wants uh, want a joint tax audit, but uh, the legal frame of reference from, for this joint tax audit uh, is not clear at all. Um, uh, it's my opinion uh, shared uh, between uh, between lo the most part of uh, European scholars in tax law that uh, the best way to find uh, a legal frame of reference for joint audit is uh, uh, the best way is to find out something at the European level. So uh, a legal frame of reference for the uh, joint audit is uh, uh, is to be found at European level. Uh, that's a theoretical uh, point of view, that's uh, an ideological point of view, uh, so uh, I agree with that. But uh, my question is, uh, in this re my question referred to these cases, to this case is, in this case, very complex, as in the end, as you explained to us, uh, the matters uh, has been matter of facts in the end. But in the very beginning, you mentioned uh, this, fact is a reorganization uh, context. You investigated a reorganization uh, ac operation activities, yes. activity. And uh, I mean, everyone, know, everyone here knows the reorganization is covered by European law, the, uh, the fiscal aspect. And it is one of the few aspects of direct taxation covered by European law. Uh, lots of persons today uh, talked about the CCCTB, but uh, it is a sort of wishful thinking. Up to now, there are not common direct taxation in the uh, European Union, when everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. The fact that uh, this joint audit uh, has been uh, uh, carried out in a context regulated by European law mainly and in after, by also it, there is a, so there are there were lots of overlapping situations between double taxation, either Germany, Italy, double taxation, and European law, and also in the end you found uh, the, 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 the the important matters was as Franz Ruska and Lundfeld uh, 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 explained thus. Uh, there were uh, sort of matters of national laws. How, the, how is, in the end, the question is, uh, what's a permanent establishment, what could be attributed in the, uh, to, the permanent, uh, to a permanent establishment, shares, uh, what's, the, what's the content of the permanent establishment? That's the, the, the main question it, it is. But uh, this uh, quite, uh, this is, this uh, uh, mixture, mixture of uh, legal uh, uh, basis, uh, European law, double taxation, that means international law and national laws. In ac according to you, uh, it should be mastered under the umbrella of joint audit ruled by European law as procedural, uh, as referred to the procedural aspects. That's my definite question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor D'Angelo, for the question, and um, which I really appreciate, because um, we, uh, I always say that with the project, the, the pilot project on joint audit that we started back in 2013 and is ongoing now, we uh, were learning by doing, because, of course, joint audit uh, is something that was really nicely described at OECD level with the report, and then we have some provision of the Administrative Cooperation Directive, which seem to allow some joint audit, but we, we had nothing more than this to explore how we could cooperate in the way we just described in the case. So, uh, first of all, I do need, we need some for the regulation. I don't know whether this can be done to um, European uh, uh, law, which uh, just regulate on different areas, like direct taxation, VAT, and duties, excise duties, or whether it is better that we keep different areas separate because of the 
specialities of each uh, legal base, as we know, and also because there is a different uh, uh, purpose in the cooperation. Well, it's very simple, but on VAT, we have developed an extensive experience on multilateral control because there are VAT fraud, and then it's very easy for country to join together to really fight together against the missing trader or whatever is the a scheme that uh, is uh, applied in the case that uh, launched the multilateral control. For direct taxation, it's a little bit different because it's um, more often addressing a question about how we allocate taxing rights between tax administration, and so uh, it's a different framework. Uh, and it's a different scope and purpose. So maybe our different areas. But still, we uh, do need some more clarity um, on the legal framework, because we all know that uh, the relevant article of the Administrative Cooperation Directive, which are Article 11 and 12 for conducting joint audit, uh, have been implemented in a different way in different countries. And this, of course, is a fact. And it may, um, of course, uh, make it dif more difficult uh, to have a joint audit multilateral program among European countries. Um, and apart from the legal basis that we have, uh, we miss some further guidelines that will uh, kind of harmonize the procedure. And this is why I'm really happy that you and Professor Reimer are conducting the research project because uh, we really need your point of view. Um, let's, uh, um, I want to remind uh, the audience that when we did the pilot phase uh, for the joint audit between the Bavarian Tax Administration and Italy, uh, we asked to the academics to review the, pro the project uh, in the academic perspective. And we, of course, were a little bit scared that we did some mistakes because we didn't have any guidelines uh, apart from the joint audit report. Um, so basically, uh, we received a good evaluation, which is, uh, make us happy, from the uh, Professor D'Angelo Professor Reimer, but some suggestions as well that we should uh, implement in the next phase. And it is with important matter like exchange of information during the joint audit, how we should keep in line with legal protection, and uh, uh, so it's matter that we don't find uh, in, in some European document, uh, either regulation or guidelines or I don't know, what is, we, should we find a committee for this? So what is the best instrument? Uh, but for sure we need more clarity in both the legal basis and the regulation. And let's imagine that, of course, the joint audit, uh, it's becoming a hot topic uh, because, of course, we want to solve cross-border matters in a quicker way, and we would like to possibly avoid the opening of mutual agreement procedure. We already have a problem with the mutual agreement procedure. This is why we had Action 14 in BEPS, and uh, we, we are working on the arbitration, and, of course, this is something that we need to work on, but if we can act with an alternative tool that is the joint audit, why shouldn't we work also on improving the tool? And this can be done also outside the EU at a more, in a more broader context. And there, it will be also a matter of whether we can export European uh, pra uh, practice uh, to other countries like OECD countries that are not part of the EU. Um, of course, uh, well, uh, the joint audit is a very important topic. Um, I think, in general, uh, the more uh, we, uh, we are learning as tax uh, official that the world is changing and the companies are becoming clients, as I heard in many conferences I, I've been recently, we should, be, uh, we should give them a service because that's the good, uh, the good uh, uh, perception. But in order to give a good service, uh, we should look at the broader picture. And so we should agree with other colleagues how to look to the picture, how we understand the fact. 
and which tool we have to solve problems. So I think uh, there's a lot of work that uh, uh, must be done. Uh, still at, at least at European level, but maybe also furthermore, to help us working and give us the certainty to uh, operating with the legal tool. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think um, <coughs> Chiara also already mentioned all the, yeah, all the framework that should be done and would make things easier because if we have such a framework, we know where we stand and we know which way we have to take to get, the, uh, to, get to the place we want to get to. Um, but beside of this, as there will be a long period, I want to emphasize the use of joint audits, although it's not always easy with the language. Yeah? I know the first joint audit I accompanied was with Austria. Yeah? It was easier, especially as we had as well a very technical discussion, and it was much easier to have this common understanding. But on the other hand, yeah, I, f I found out, especially in this case, how good it works if you have the opportunity to get into a communication. Also, I'm only able to order a pizza in Italy, and maybe a <laughs> bottle of wine. <laughs> but it worked out, we got, we got along, and we also understood each other. It took a time, but it worked out. And what I just want to emphasize is that it is very important to have persons to whom you rely that this will work and to whom you can talk if such a problem arises. So we should establish, we should establish institutions under which it's easy to get in contact with the other country, as it is, for instance, the Internationale Steuerzentrum. And finally, that's my last word, I think, um, the very big advantage of a joint audit in comparison to a mutual agreement procedure is that in a joint audit you have the, the chance to develop a common understanding, to find a common solution and that's much better than fighting for the own decision what you do in the mutual agreement procedure. So I think it's in the interest of all of us if we promote projects like the joint audit. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are running out of time. I think this was a perfect final statement for our tax audit forum. What we have learned here is that from ordering pizza to talking about reorganization cases is quite easy for Bavarian tax administration. So I'm quite uh, positive uh, that we will move on with our cooperation and of course also with this discussion. For now, I think that's the great finale. I thank you and you very, very much uh, for your contributions. I thank you very, very much for coming, for your contributions, for the discussion, for the pleasant time we had with you. And well, I say thank you very much, goodbye, and it's up to you, Martin. But this is not quite the end. It's not quite the end, but uh, today we really have the grand finale because I'm very happy uh, to announce the speaker for the uh, summary. And he's going to summarize the entire conference, uh, the ministerial adherent Eckhard Schmidt. And since 2001, he is head of the uh, tax department of the Bavarian Finance Ministry. And I was fortunate enough to be able to work for him for six years. And I can say it was great fun. and. Uh, he contributed to that fund. He's a great tax expert. Uh, he's an advisor in economic affairs and much esteemed. Let us welcome uh, the chairman of the sponsor association of this event, Mr. Eckhard Schmidt. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dear colleagues, we're at the end of a very demanding and I think successful event. And I have the honor now of summarizing these two days very briefly. Uh, this is not an easy task, especially 
uh, if you want to do that in 50 minutes. And if you look at the interesting discussions we had, it's very difficult. All I can do from my point of view is uh, to bring up a few salient uh, points from uh, these two days. I think every one of you came here with different expectations and special interests. And uh, that is why, looking back at this event, uh, he might see certain things differently. I want to try and do this from my point of view. What we saw right at the very beginning, from the very beginning, was the question, what rights uh, does the uh, taxpayer have in connection with um, the exchange of information and the joint audit? That is something that we don't always pay attention to. Professor Mellinghoff, in his welcome address, immediately brought up this uh, topic. Uh, he talked about what is the protection of the taxpayer in the country-by-country country reporting, what protection does he have when uh, we have this mutual uh, system assistance. And uh, what does, is his protection in the event of a situation where aiding and abetting happens? Then we had two academic or scientific presentation, and that gave us a more theoretical perspective. And when we have joint orders, and especially in where international taxation is concerned, we're still at the very beginning, and a lot of questions arise which still have to be solved. Professor Lang, in his presentation, pointed out again uh, that the rights of the taxpayer and especially the uh, possibility of a, a legal protection is something that needs to be underlined. Oblig obligatory arbitration clauses are part of a further development of international law. And what I also remember is uh, the appraisal of the baseball arbitration. That's something that I learned during this conference. And I think he showed us that one can go beyond the individual case and one can uh, a substantiated decision uh, would uh, provide more legal security. That is what be is behind the baseball arbitration. After that, we had Professor Baker. It's always a great joy to listen to him. And he uh, talked about the rights of the taxpayer as well. And he summarized by saying that in the current debate, uh, very often the taxpayer isn't sufficiently taken into account, especially in view of the current BEPS discussion, also as far as data protection under European law is concerned. And these warnings should uh, be taken into account um, in spite of all the joy one has in connection with the exchange of information, especially on an international level. And uh, Professor Mellinghoff already pointed out uh, that uh, the uh, public country-by-country country reporting is very problematic for him, not only for the uh, taxpayer, for the companies, but also uh, for the countries themselves if there's a relationship to threshold countries or merging countries. And then we had another interesting aspect relating to the exchange of information. I think he talked about, used the word tsunami. And that was another interesting aspect that he pointed out, i.e. whether the countries will, and the administrations will be able to deal with all of this technologically speaking and uh, guarantee the protection of uh, the citizen in terms of a technology. And I think this is a problem that we as a tax authorities are going to be confronted with huge difficulties here. And then we had the practical cases. Uh, these cases show uh, practical problems when you have cross-border audits. The first case 
was related to the experience of our auditors with a joint of audits. And this term isn't well defined. Uh, the colleagues of the, from the authorities from uh, Bavaria, Sweden, and Austria came to the same result, that there are different provisions in the various countries and possibilities, but that uh, such a joint audit is a great uh, possibility to solve problems, uh, taxation problems uh, during the audit. And I think this is in the interest of the taxpayer as well as in the interest of the tax authorities. And the colleague showed very clearly that not all problems have been solved. I would just remind you of the different handling as to whether the taxpayer has to approve uh, such a tax audit or not. The next case uh, didn't concern the uh, practical cases. It's uh, the It concerned the AOA, which was implemented under German law as well for the taxation of the PEs. And this gives rise to a lot of new questions. And here again, the discussion was very lively after we had Mr. Hamann, the father of this approach. That was a great joy to be able to welcome you, and it was very helpful for us. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how uh, this approach will prove itself in practical terms. And as, uh, conflicts could arise between the different countries as far as the individual valuations are concerned. And in the next case, uh, that was the last case yesterday afternoon. I personally wasn't there because I had to uh, participate and attend a different conference. Uh, but I was uh, very happy that we were able to get a representative of the Chinese tax authority. And this case dealt with issues which I'm sure would preoccupy us in the future and present us with difficulties in our everyday work when we carry out audits, uh, the cost allocation agreements also in the relationship of Germany and China. I wasn't there, I just took notes, and here it's not only about the treatment according to the existing DTA, but the future treatment of the new DTA as from the 1st of January next year, which will come into force then with China. Uh, then we had the evening event, I was there, and I was able to address a few words to you, and I think this was a very nice evening. And uh, thanks again to those who made this evening possible. And uh, today started with a case which uh, went into a different direction, i.e., how does the old law deal with new technology? And based on the uh, case of the 3D printer, the colleagues showed us that a, a simple procedure such as that uh, that you use a different technology, uh, big legal issues arise. If uh, the uh, product is printed abroad and the uh, PE is abroad as well, is that a relocation of uh, functions? And if so, in which direction for which company? And the discussion showed that this question is very complex and that digitization will confront us with new issues in many respects. We in uh, the authorities consider uh, digitization, uh, our own uh, digitization. If IT doesn't work, the entire authority comes to a standstill, and that applies to uh, banks and ATMs. If they don't work, that's very bad. And for us, it's the same. Without IT, we can't work anymore. So that um, covers all areas, production and the companies, and with all legal concepts. We are not fully prepared for that. So I, uh, I learned a lot from this case and took one wisdom. So whatever is gone is gone. That leads me to the panel we had afterwards this morning. and. I also took some takeaway from Mr. Collett that 
that you see the importance of a marriage contract only once there is this, this divorce. That was an interesting discussion that led to our topic, into the topic of joint audit. And one thing that was interesting in this to see at the different approaches, you can call it inductive and deductive. You can look at the legal framework and say, do we have to change the law? So what we can do deductively, and where we see where the free legal frameworks have to be improved, or where lawmakers have to be asked um, to improve the legal framework. And as I said during the discussion, and as I speak for my colleagues from administration, we prefer something uh, more the inductive method. So under the given circumstances to do what we believe is necessary and what we're able to do, and also then we can see whatever we need to require from the lawmakers. Definitely, there's need for action. Well, the last case. There's one thing that I learned from the last case. This morning, we heard a lot, and I said that as well. The most important in joint audits is to um, establish the facts. And in this case, the facts were not the problem. And every party knew the facts. But in this case, you were seeing uh, how to combine two legal systems that are not too far away and to coordinate them and also to understand the mutual systems. And it showed that these joint audits um, also provide the opportunity to create an understanding for the other part, for the other side, and to be able to reach reasonable solutions, which is a highly important point. That's what I wanted to say in the morning. That's not only about facts, but also it's vital to see the conclusions with the binding effect. We don't have the ability to solve all the issues by, by, with binding effect. Finally, I'm the chairman of the Support Association. And for this event, I'd like to say thank you very much. And with a full conviction, again, Thanks to the sponsors for their generous support, providing financial support for this event. Thanks to our two moderators. They helped us um, very professionally and led us through the program. So if you don't want to work, work on in legal any longer, you might become moderators as well in public life. But it's not so nice. We would lose very good legal experts. So we don't want to lose these legal experts, although they could do other jobs excellently. I so thank all the speakers with their well-prepared charts, which they prepared on the side of the normal jobs. And you explained all the topics very nicely. Yes, sir. We're available for discussions and to criticism. Thanks to the nice helpers that made this event a great success. Mr. Becker, who also helped me with the summary, couldn't do this completely alone. One special thanks to the employees of the International Tax Center. which is only one and a half people, or two people, for Dr. Ergel and Ms. Reimann, and others who support it. But these are the two. Thank 
So without them, we wouldn't have our audits or project management, and we wouldn't have this event either. There's another one. Is he not here? Where is Dr. Eiskober? He's there. Please come over. Lieber Herr Dr. Eiskruber, ohne Sie. Dear Dr. Eiskruber, this tax center would not be without you. This event would not happen without you. You are the engine for all this. There's so much power in this place, and thank you very much from my side. That was a great event. Ganz zuletzt aber ein herzlicher Dank Ihnen allen, die Sie durch Ihre Beiträge, durch Ihr Dabeisein... Thanks to all of you, by the way, who made this um, event a success with all your contributions. So I wish you a good trip home. You may still have a coffee here and go on talking. And I look forward to meeting you again in two years, in November when we're going to have another meeting like this. Thank you very much.